Welcome, Family Church. We are so glad that you are here. We are in the middle of a sermon series called God on Trial. I don't know if you've caught the irony of this, that we're putting God on trial. He created the universe. He's the one that sets the law in place. And yet when Jesus comes to earth, he lives a perfect life following every one of those laws. And then he's put on trial. And guess why he's put on trial? Because he says, I am God. And here's the beauty of it. He's actually guilty of what they're accusing him of. They just don't believe that it's true. And one of the things I've been really contemplating was that I was looking at the story of Jesus and, and really about his death and resurrection, that the moment he was put on trial, he was in front of the Pharisees and he's in front of Pilate and the Romans and, and the trial is happening and there could be some anxiety inside, but only once the trial is over do the real trials begin. I mean, the actual pain, the actual loss, the actual heartbreak begins at the conclusion of that. And we're going to look at a little of that today. And I was thinking about this last week, uh, how I always think the week is going to go. I think it's going to be pristine and beautiful. And then life starts. It didn't take long last week. On a Monday, I got into the, the church and I was doing some stuff and I set my keys down. They keep having a problem with the beeper on it. So I just set them down so it doesn't go off. And I set them down and then walked outside and locked myself out. And I had to call Pastor Drew. And a little part of my week went a little awry. Just, it's not quite what I thought it was going to be. And then on Friday, I was out in Camas Valley area. And uh, sure enough, I locked my keys in my car. And now I have some real problems because now I'm like 20 miles from home. And I had to have a friend drive me all the way back into town, get another key, drive it back out. And I was thinking, those are two just small circumstantial problems. Forget the fact that sometimes we actually have emotional trauma and our relationships fracture and the money isn't quite there. And suddenly life ends up looking a lot more like this in the beautiful, pristine beginning that I thought it was going to be. Let me show you something that the church has been doing for the last oh, 2,000 years. This, no, mind you, this is the church, not Jesus, but here's the idea. Make sure you just cover it up really good. Because here's the idea. The idea of the church life, I don't mean the, the Jesus life, the church life is to make sure you just cover up all the bad stuff. Why don't you think to yourself for a minute, how many of you have had one of those moments already where you have had a fight on your way to church? Or those of you who are watching at home, you've already had a fight this morning. Yet on the way to church, what is it that you do? You make sure that as soon as you get there, everything else is locked down. You make sure it all looks good. Isn't it sad that church is one of the few places where we've been wearing masks for the last 2,000 years? I know for the last year we've been uncomfortable wearing the physical mask. But how sad it is that the more dangerous, the more insidious mask is the one that we put on to say everything's fine. But I want to be honest with you. It's not fine. You're not fine. And things aren't fine. And here's what I want to walk through with you. Here's what I want you to see today. Here's my target for you today, is that in your not fineness, in the brokenness, you aren't alone, and you don't have to be alone. I got a friend who, years ago, he was working at a funeral home, and it was one of those really old buildings, and if you've ever worked in an old building, there is a treat. I actually had the chance to work in a hardware store that was in a building that was built in 1912. The year the Titanic sank, that was the year our building was built, and my friend was working in one of those kind of buildings, and it had an old elevator, only two stories, but it had an elevator, and uh, in this elevator, this is how old it was, it didn't have doors. How cool is that? You press the button and you can see the ceiling become the floor. And as you rise up, well, my friend was standing there and he wasn't watching or paying attention. He was just thinking about whatever he had to have done. And he was rocking back and forth and without noticing, bam! Sorry if I scared you, but that's exactly what happened to him. He got his foot caught between the ceiling of the bottom, the floor of the second story, and the 1,500 pound elevator pressing up against it. He's hitting the button. Help! Help! He's trapped. He can't get his foot out. I don't know if you've noticed this. There are only certain ways the human body is supposed to bend. And when his foot was trapped there, he started bending in a way that it's not supposed to bend. He started, all of a sudden, he's a pretzel leaning forward over the edge and they have to call 911. And sure enough, firefighters come and the EMS comes and the manager's there. Do we restart it? Because it has an automatic shutoff. Maybe if we restart it, we can get it to go down. But what if it presses up against his foot and there's all this trauma and finally the firefighters bring in these ladder jacks, two of them, one on each side of his foot, and they're hammering them in, trying to create leverage so they can remove the foot from being trapped in the elevator. And sure enough, they, they get it done and they get my friend up onto a gurney and he's laying there and they're cleaning up, writing reports, and they're getting everything filled out and they're getting it all in order, and 
This is funny. Out of nowhere, his roommate shows up. His roommate, Dave. He wasn't really close with Dave. I don't know if you've ever had a roommate where you, they help pay the bills, but you're not really tight with them. It was that kind of relationship my friend had with his roommate. But his roommate walked up to him while he's sitting on the gurney and everyone else is bustling about doing other things. He comes up and puts his hand on my friend's hand and says, I'm so sorry this happened to you. Are you okay? You see, when Dave came in, what he offered was something that no one else had yet. Other people were solving the problem. Dave was coming in to connect with the person. He put his hand on my friend's hand and said, Are you okay? I'm so sorry this happened to you. He offered, he was the first to offer empathy. Both were there to solve a problem. One of the first group was there to solve the physical problem. Dave was there to help with the emotional problem. He was there to help the person. You know what I want you to know today? I want you to know that you can be connected with someone who knows what it's like. Interesting thing about that story is when you hear stories like that, you may be touched by the empathy that's shown because you desperately need it. And you hope that you have people in your life like that. But you know what else I notice is when you are connected with someone in the story, your heart ties to it even more. You know who that was trapped in the elevator? It's Pastor Paul. Almost lost a leg. Well, a foot, toe. It could have been bad. Think about it. He might have never walked in. Think of all of the, the thoughts that were going through his head. This is what he looked like at the time. Yep. Uh, I want to be the first to tell you that Paul Glazner is actually Bob Ross. They are the same person. It was funny, my 12-year-old, I had my notes sitting on my counter, and my 12-year-old came in and said, is that Bob Ross? I'm like, no, it's Papa Paul. Yeah. So here's the funny thing about it. When you know the person, it connects you to it. But here's the other thing that I think that is so critical is, is that when you connect with someone who is giving you that empathy, who's saying, I've been there too, it means so much to your relationship. And specifically today, I want you to know that Jesus knows what you're going through, and he want, I want you to know that he has gone through it He's not telling you to get over it. He's saying, I've been through it. You see, even more than Dave coming up and putting his hand on Paul and saying, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. It means even more if in your past, you've been through it too. I just had this special connection with someone in my life. And I don't, I'm not particularly close with this person in terms of um, proximity. I, I live in Roseburg and I go to the Green Campus. She lives in Elkton and she goes to the Sutherland Campus. Uh, But Robin Wilgus, Pastor Ed's, wife is someone that I have a particular connection to because five and a half years ago, she and I were trapped on the campus of UCC during the shooting. And especially during October, there is a connection that Robin and I have because we understand how the other person feels because the two of us went through that together. And here's what I'm hoping you see today is that when you, when you see what Jesus went through, you'll realize that what you're going through, Jesus says, I've been there too. See, Jesus is the one in the story that it's amazing. Not only is he the one that comes to solve the problem like the firefighters, he's also the person like Dave to put his hand on Paul's hand and say, I'm so sorry this is happening to you because I think that Jesus is one of the most empathetic characters in all of history. First thing that I want you to know is that he understands emotional pain. He has felt the anguish that you have felt. And we're just going to go straight into the, the Easter story. The night before, we find out that Jesus is betrayed by one of his closest friends. He's got 12 guys that he's closest with, and one of them sells him out for 30 pieces of silver. His name is Judas. And growing up as a kid who knew a lot about the Bible, every time I read about Judas in the Bible, my thought was always, oh, Judas is a bad dude. Watch out for him. So before he ever betrays Jesus, my mind is, hey, Jesus, watch out for that guy. That guy's bad news. Do not trust him. Well, here's what I th- think is interesting. I had always thought G- that Jesus kept Judas at an arm's length. Just hang on. Yeah, Judas, you can come along. Well, well just let him come. It's fine. Judas, come, you can come. You know what it says, though? It says that Judas betrayed Jesus, which means you can't betray someone unless you're on an inner circle. It means that Jesus had a heart open to Judas. So let's just start with some emotional trauma. Let's just start the night before where for 30 pieces of silver, Judas thought that was worth the life of a friend and he sold him out. Let's just connect with you real quickly. The odds are pretty good that someone in your life, you've trusted someone and they've let you down and maybe they've sold you out for something easier. Spouses that have been traded in for a younger model or someone who said, you know what, the job is more important than the family. You know what this is like. Let's just start with Jesus knows what that's like too. You are not alone. After that, Peter, another one of his disciples, denies that he knows him three times. 
And then it gets really tough. After the trial ends, he's taken out and he's given to the Romans. And, and the Roman soldiers, they spend a little time with him. And, and they do four things that I think are so fascinating. They give him a crown. They give him a robe. They kneel before him. And then they say a line that we have sung at churches for the last 2,000 years. Hail, king. But here's what's so interesting about the way the Romans do it. When the Romans go to Jesus and they say, Hail, King of the Jews, and they bow before him and they give him a crown and a robe, they are doing it in mockery. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. What I want you to see here is when he's mocked, they're attacking his identity. They're attacking his calling. What did Jesus come to do? He came to be the king. Not just King of the Jews, too. He's the King of Kings. And they are saying, Hail. They don't mean it. He is being attacked. Now, I want you to think back through your life. I want you to think through all of those words that have been said. Those words that maybe your father said that said you'll never amount to something. Or those words of your mother if you just tried harder. Or maybe it was the coach or it was the, the teacher. But someone said those words. Maybe it was someone that was a girlfriend or someone that you, you trusted. And they, they, they said those words and it totally undercut you. Saying to you, your identity, you're not worth what you think you are. And they cut you down. I want you to know, Jesus knows how you feel. In fact, the soldiers actually did it for so long, and I love it, New Living says it this way, when they finally grew tired of mocking him, when they ran out of words to use, then they let it go. But they came after him, and they attacked him directly in his identity and directly in his calling. Then once he's up on the cross and he's, he's hanging there dying, there are two groups of people that come and they give another attack. One of them is a group of people that are just bystanders, but they know enough about what Jesus has said. You see, here's what they say. You were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Jesus had said this. He was talking not about the temple temple. He was actually in process of doing what they were saying. The temple he was talking about was his own body. Tear this down. In three days, I will rebuild it. But here's what they're saying. Hey, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. This is some bystanders that were just there. Then some of the Pharisees, the people that put him on trial, they came up and they said, he saved others. Let him save himself. You see what they're attacking here? They've already, the, the soldiers have already attacked his identity and his calling. Now they're attacking his gifting. This is why Jesus came. It was to save people. And they're, they're, they're goading him. Hey, come on down. You know what you call this? In sports, you call it trash talking. Oh, you got Jesus? Feed a few thousand people, walk on water, but now when it really gets tough, you can't do it? Interestingly enough, in athletics, it's kind of the inverse of what we see with Jesus. In athletics, whenever you have someone that trash talks, usually the most competitive people will rise up and they will respond by wanting to tear your face off. And, and I don't know of anyone more competitive in, in my understanding of sports than this guy. And I love the look on his face right here. Absolute anger, absolute terror. In fact, they, they say, if you're ever going to trash talk, never do it with Jordan. When he makes a shot, just say, nice shot, Mr. Jordan. But you don't ever chirp at him. They call it tugging on Superman's cape because he's going to turn around, he's going to tear you apart. Conversely, now just have Jesus with that. So Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's lived the perfect life. He's been put on trial. He's been denied by his, one of his closest friends and betrayed by another. And here he hangs and they're chirping at him. Is that all you got? And you know what he says? Father, forgive them. They actually say, come down. Here's what's crazy about it. He can do that. Do you really think that nail is really what's holding him there? The guy created the world. He can walk on water. We later know that he can walk through a wall. He can take five loaves and two fish and turn them into food for 5,000. And yet, he stays on a cross. Why? I think there's a key word you got to hear. It's meekness. I'm not saying weakness. Weakness is when you can't do anything else. That's like me playing against Michael Jordan. That's weakness. I got nothing. I have no ability to respond. If he trash talks with me, I'd be like, <laughs> what are you going to do? But with Jesus, this isn't weakness. This is power. He has all the ability. In my favorite way too, I'm like, I got to go more with like the Zeus style. Not only is, would he come down, he'd also have bolts of lightning hit them, just smash them, but Jesus doesn't. He has all the power to do all of that. And he remains. 
What is it about him that does that? It's pretty simple. He has a depth of love beyond the pain. And here's what I want you to see. In the midst of every emotional heartache you felt, you're not alone. Jesus has been through it too. And he wants to be with you in it right now. Now, not only did Jesus have to walk through the emotional pain and the trauma that was going on of both the loss of friends and the betrayal and the denial and the mocking of the very things that God had called him to that put him on, on, on earth, but he also went through immense physical pain. The next one on your outline is physical pain. As soon as the trial ends in, in chapter 27, Pilate orders this. He ordered that Jesus be flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Now, I don't know if you've ever actually had any type of leather apparatus hit your body. When I was a kid's pastor, I wanted the, the kids to understand the, the pain that would come with leather whipping your body. And I don't know why, but I always ended up hurting myself when I was trying to express stuff to the kids about what Jesus went through. And one time, I, so I had this leather necklace and I took the leather strap off of it and I went from here and whipped around my back. So I'm talking from here to here. So it's moving maybe two feet and snaps around my back. It cut my skin. It didn't bleed where it was like, like blood flowing, but it took all of the skin off and it was just like this long scab for a week. It took from here to here to do that. And here's what I want you to see. What Jesus flogging would have looked more like this. It would have had nine leather straps and at the end of it would have had a lead tip. Sometimes they would have used stone as well. And they would lash him 39 times. The belief was that if you did it 40 times, it would kill him. And they didn't want to do that because they had something else waiting for him. But 39 times, they brought that hammer down upon his back and whipped him. The idea, in fact, if you look at John 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh. The actual word there is carne. And if you were back here for the Christmas holiday season, Pastor Paul talked about the idea that the word Jesus became flesh. This is a great picture of it because his body went from a human body to actual torn flesh. Deep, deep physical pain, but they weren't done. Then they twisted that crown of thorns I told you about a little bit ago and set it on his head. Now, when I think of this, I think of the cute little things that we make for Easter that we put up for decorations. But in actuality, it would have had thorns that were approximately about one inch long. And if you've ever had, this is what I imagine it being, some form of a hawthorn bush. I hate that bush. Every time you cut it down and try to get rid of it, it doesn't matter how good your gloves are, it'll get through the glove and poke you and it's got that little bit of poison in it. Just enough to, to your hand aches at the end of the day. Well, they put this on his head, but they weren't done with it. Forget that there's spikes on it. Then they took a staff and they struck him on the head again and again. Now picture that. So you have, a, you have a staff smacking him in the head. So you have some form of a concussion. Not only that, those one-inch spikes are now driven into the skull. Now he's got no flesh left on his back. He's got a crown of thorns on his head and it's been beat onto his head. But they're not done. Then he has to walk out from the city to the place where they're going to execute him. And his job is to carry his means of execution, which is probably not the whole cross, but the cross beam. And in the midst of his current physical condition, he cannot do it. There's this great moment where someone else is brought into, in the midst of Jesus' physical pain, it's so heavy he cannot continue on. The creator of the world and the son of God is laying here unable to continue carrying his own means of execution. And the Roman soldier says, we'll get someone else to help. And they get a guy out of the crowd. His, his name's Simon of Cyrene. And we know that he and his two sons later become followers of Jesus. Listen to this moment that they're brought into it. In the midst of Jesus' most agonizing physical pain, he's told, carry the cross. And so he takes the cross off of Jesus' shoulders and he begins walking down with Jesus. Now, can you imagine later when, when it's church service time when we talk about what Jesus has done in their life and Simon gets to tell the story about how he carried Jesus' cross for him where Jesus' blood it was dripping down his cheek and it was on his clothes for days. What a moment. Well, Jesus continues on and once they get down to the place of the skull called Golgotha where they're going to execute him, after they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers began gambling for his clothes. They stretched his arms out and they put his feet over the top. And there they nailed his hands to the cross and his feet to the cross. And they put that pole up into the ground. And there they held him there waiting. Nine inch spikes driven through his hands, probably through his wrists, so that it would hold him there. 
When I was a kid's pastor, I had brought a, a spike similar to this to, to show the kids this is the, this is the type of nail that would have been driven through his hands. Because when we think of nails, we're thinking like 16 penny, they're two and a half inch. And we don't realize that this is a nine inch spike that was driven through. And after showing it to the kids, I put it into my pouch, my um, satchel. And I didn't think about it, but three days later, I went to Eugene Airport and went to try and get on a plane where my bag went through, and this is after 9-11, my bag went through TSA, and they said, uh, sir, hold on, come over here. And they pulled it out and said, what is this? Don't try to get on a plane after doing a kid's service where you have a 10-inch spike, 9-inch spike in there. And I said, I'm so sorry. We had just done the Easter story, and that was to show what Jesus had gone through. And it was an interesting little thing. We had talked about the Jesus story with the kids, and there I am in the Eugene airport talking about the Jesus story again because of what God had done, because of the physical pain that he had gone through. And, and here's what, what I've just been really wrestling with. I'm noticing more and more, the older I get, that physical pain is a natural part of life. Do you remember when you were 12 when you could just run all day long and you never really ached and stuff? I can tell I'm getting older. Two ways I can tell I'm getting older. One is I start hurting myself when I'm sneezing or when I'm sleeping. You wake up and you're like, I, I, I got to call in sick. What happened? I, I slept wrong. I can't do it. I said this the other week. I was talking about this and I heard some, some lady in, in her 60s said, oh, just you wait. And I went, oh, you're right. It gets worse. But if you are in that stage where you're starting to feel the physical nature of it, or perhaps there is some chronic pain that you're dealing with and you're starting to wrestle, I heard one, one time someone say that the beauty of physical pain is it reminds us to pray. And that's true. You act, you act like everything's okay until your knee goes bad and then you're, you're crying out to Jesus. Well, when it gets long enough, sometimes instead of crying out to Jesus, you just become angry with Jesus. Well, here's what I want you to know. If you're going through some real physical pain, you are not alone. This is not some God sitting on a cloud. This is God who put on skin and walked around for 33 years in exhaustion. And then at the end of it, experienced more physical agony than I could possibly imagine. You know what I, I think one of the main reasons was? For when we're in that moment, and he could put his hand on your arm and say, I am so sorry you're going through this. I know how you feel. I've been there too. Well, not only do I see that Jesus Christ went through emotional pain and physical pain, perhaps the most stark one is the spiritual pain that Jesus went through. I want to look back at actually the night before. So this is the night of the trial. We find Jesus in a garden. He's got three of his closest friends, and they are off. Um, he leaves them all by themselves, and he goes off, and he wants to have a conversation with Dad. He wants to have a conversation to say, hey, can we, can we do something different? This is what he says, Dad. I don't want to do this. God, God, my father, please, let's do something different. The spiritual agony that he's in at this moment is beyond what he can take. And he says this, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, what do you want? It's not what I want, it's what you want. But you know this plan we've had through all eternity? Let's do something different. Catch the emotional turmoil, the spiritual turmoil he's in, it's so intense that his actual capillaries in his forehead burst and he sweats blood because it's so much anxiety over this because he knows the weight of this because the spiritual pain he is going through is so immense because while he's in this moment, you know what I think this is? This is what I call a Jonah moment. You know what Jonah moments are? It's that terror moment when God says, I want you there. And you say, man, it looks better over there. I want to go that way. And that's, so Jonah, he was called to go to Nineveh. He hated them. And historically, he may have every right to hate those people from Nineveh. But God called him to go. And he said, Father, if it is possible, forget you, I'm out. And he, he's just gone. I think Jesus is in that moment. This is where you're calling me to go? I know what that means. Can we? But then that line at the end. But not as I will. But as you will, but catch this. You got to catch the heartbreak in this, the spiritual turmoil that he's wrestling with that is killing him. You know, uh, one of the things I remember Mr. Rogers saying after 9 11, a lot of people were asking Mr. Rogers in that beautiful way that Fred Rogers had the ability to speak to kids. People were asking, what do we tell our kids about being afraid? And, and he said, you know, I remember being afraid as a kid. And my mom said to me, 
Always look for the heroes. Always look for the helpers and the heroes running into the building. You know what I love about Jesus here? He knows the tension and the turmoil if he heads in there. But this is the hero moment. This is a lot like him hanging on that cross and saying, oh, I'll stay right here. Say what you will. I'm in. And once he's on the cross, he knows the spiritual turmoil that's coming in the garden, but then on the cross, look what he says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He quotes King David from a thousand years before. You know why he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at this moment, while Jesus is on the cross, the sky turns black for those three hours, and we know that the Father turns his face away from the Son. And for the first time in all eternity, Jesus the Son and God the Father are not in connection. And here's why. Because of me. And because of you. Because I am a sinner. And my sins were put on him. And here's the way the story goes. God the perfect Father cannot be in connection with sin. And Jesus right now, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So you want to see this? He, this? he asked the question. I'll give you the answer. So just look at the screen right here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Will Irwin. That's why. Because Will Irwin's a sinner. You can put your name in there too. Because you are a sinner. I was just thinking about where we are in this story because at the end of this, then he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he gives up his spirit and he dies. Hemingway says that all real stories, all true stories end in death. Well, I don't think he was fully correct. I think all, all true stories include death, but in this case, this is not the end of the story because we have Jesus living through the emotional pain, the physical pain, and the spiritual pain, but he's not done with pain. Because though he is dead, he won't stay that way for long. Because three days later, he rose from the dead and he conquered pain. Yes, he's endured emotional pain. He has gone through the physical pain and he has gone through a spiritual pain beyond what I can fathom. But he beats pain. And he walks through it so that he can walk through it with us. And one of the things I want you to see is the healing of hearts. You remember that emotional pain that you're in? He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He did all of this to bring healing to those places. Not only is he empathetic and come put your hand, his hand on yours, he is also the one that can save you and heal you and bring freedom to the place where you are trapped. He brings in the ladder jacks, hammers them down and pulls you out and puts you on the gurney, puts a cast on there and helps you heal. Not only does he conquer pain, he's in the process of healing you in it. Well, not only does he do that, he also conquers death. There's this great line. Uh, there's in, it's in a lot of the Christian songs that comes from uh, 1 Corinthians. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. It says, where, O oh, death, is your sting? When I had first heard that, I thought that was such a great line. It was so invigorating. And I thought to myself, whenever people die, you don't need to be sad because they're going to heaven if they become a follower of Jesus. It's a very callous perspective. And there's truth in it because Jesus rose from the dead. Death, no, the sting has been taken. And, until, and I thought that to be totally and 100% true until I walked through some death. Not my own death, but the death of people around me. You see, when... When my grandparents died, it fit. Death, where's your sting? Well, yeah, my grandmother and grandfather lived till they were 80. Yeah, where's your sting? But then a few years ago, when we watched a 31-year-old girl get stage four cervical cancer at the Green Campus, where, oh, death is your sting didn't seem to mean what it did because I saw a lot of sting. It was the first time in my life I really walked through death with someone. And I don't mean a grandparent, but I mean someone. Someone that you thought deserved longer. And I couldn't say death wears your sting because I sure felt the sting. And the family felt the sting. And here was the reality that we came to. That death still has a sting. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, it's no longer eternal. And what once 
would have separated us from the person forever because Elisa has a relationship with Jesus. She is with Jesus now. And because we have relationships with Jesus, those of us who have chosen to give our life to him, we have a hope and we can say, death, where is your sting? In grave, where is your victory? You have no power over us. And it's all because of what Jesus did, not only in conquering death, but he also conquered sin. Because here's the straight story, the real story of all eternity, is that I am on the far side of, of the relationship. Because of my sin, because of your sin, you are separated from God, and he is so far from us, we could never get there. And if I were able to do everything in my power to try and reach him, I could never do it. It'd be like jumping from here to Chicago. Just, yeah, let me just jump there. You can't do it. Because all you have to do is live a perfect life. And all of us agree, we haven't done it. So there's this massive separation. This is why this story happened. Because we were way over there and God was over there. And there was this chasm of sin. And Jesus Christ said, I'll take care of it. And so when he came to earth, he lived 33 years and he didn't sin he never rolled his eyes at his mom. He never lied. He never chose lust. He never chose himself. He always did what was right. And then at the end, he was what we can't be, the perfect sacrifice, because the price for our sin is death. And so Jesus took it on himself. So not only did Jesus conquer death by rising from the dead, he also conquered sin itself. I don't know where you are today, but for some of you, you are in such emotional turmoil. You don't know how to proceed. And some of you, the physical pain is beyond what you can bear. And for some of you, you're in a Jonah moment right now. And God's saying, hey, I want you to go. And you're like, no, I don't want to. He's saying, I want you to confess. You're like, I don't want to. And submission to him is not what you want to do. And there's so much turmoil inside of you. In each of these situations, here's what I want you to know. That Jesus knows exactly how you feel. Wow, what a powerful message. It talks about real life stuff. And, you know, I, I think of how pain in my life and the life of others I've seen, um, sometimes it divides us from God. Sometimes we, we are hurting and so we feel angry with God. And, and I think that's a normal stage to go through, but it's a terrible place to stay. And, and if you understand that Jesus has been through everything, all kinds of things that we've experienced, and I hope it gives you the courage to begin to, to open up and to begin to talk to Jesus honestly. And if you don't have the words for it yourself, let me encourage you to read through some of the Psalms. Boy, especially David just seemed to, he was so raw in his emotions and his struggles and his feelings about the things that were happening in his life. And, and he loved God and he knew God loved him enough to just be honest. And then maybe I could suggest something else that would help make it real. As you find a trusted brother or sister in Christ, and you tell them, I'm not okay. I am struggling. And maybe there's a, a hidden temptation you've been giving into for a long time. Or maybe there's a hurt or a bitterness or, or a doubt. Something that's been just holding you back. And I want to encourage you, you. Your first step of healing often is bringing that forward and letting, letting Christ know about it. And then letting somebody else that, that also loves you and loves the Lord, let them know. Otherwise, we go through this fakey thing where we give surface prayer requests and we tell everybody we're fine and we, we put on this, this Christian facade and ultimately that makes us feel lonely and traps us in our pain. And so I want to pray for us that God will give us the courage to talk to him about our pain and to talk to somebody else. Let's pray. God, thank you that this really emphasizes that you experience everything that we do plus a whole lot more. And because of that, we can trust you and we know that you'll understand and you'll care about us in the middle of it. And I thank you, Father, also for being a part of a church family where we can share with each other and be honest. And I ask that you would help us to transition our belief in what Jesus went through into understanding how that means we can trust you with our pain and our struggle and that we can be honest and open with each other. And God, I pray that you would use this to bring healing and wholeness and honesty and authenticity. In Jesus' name, amen.